<laughs> okay. Wow, did not know that. I argued that at Los Alamos from 1943 to 45 was the largest collection of geniuses ever put together in the entire history of the world. That there is no place in recorded human history which had a higher concentration of brilliant minds than Los Alamos from 43 to 45. Now, if you were to take a similar group of geniuses today and put them in an isolated community and gave, gave them an assignment, uh, probably there would be factions within uh, a week and a half. Within uh, a month, a group would not be speaking to each other, and within two months, one group would leave. But they got along. <clears throat> they got along with each other, and the reason was the goal was so overriding so overwhelming uh, that there was nothing that could keep them uh, from uh, pursuing it. Uh, so uh, the, this group of geniuses who interacted with one another, here's Enrico Fermi, uh, the last man who knew everything in terms of physics, or so he's been called. Who's this? Yes, this is Edward Teller, uh, the most controversial of all the, uh, the scientists he, as, as Enrico Fermi said, Edward, you're the only monomaniac I know who has a multitude of manias. <laughs> <laughs> he, here is Niels Bohr, spelled B-O-H-R. Uh, Niels Bohr is not as well known as Einstein, but historians of science say that he had the same candle power as Albert Einstein. He was an equal, uh, equal level of genius. He came to Los Alamos as part of the British mission. He didn't get involved with any of the science, but he was very concerned with what would happen after the bomb was produced. Would it cause an arms race with the Soviet Union? And he tried his best to stop an arms race, but of course he failed. <clears throat> this is Sir Rudolf Pyrrhals spelled P-E-I-E-R-L-S. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to interview him over the phone. I mean, all these people are geniuses. Uh, Sir Rudolph, who just died about eight years ago, uh, became very anti-nuclear after the war. And he was, he's British, naturalized British citizen. Uh, and during the anti-nuclear rallies of the 80s, he was and nobody knew who he was because he dressed in a raincoat and just a little beret. He was passing out anti-nuclear leaflets in Trafalgar Square. So Rudolf Pyrrhals. <clears throat> and here is John von Neumann. And nobody knows of him either. V-O-N-N-E-U-M-A-N-N, -N -N, John von Neumann. But Oppenheimer felt that von Neumann was the brightest person that he, Oppenheimer, had ever met. So Oppenheimer felt that von Neumann was the brightest person that he'd met. Some people have said, and I don't know how you prove this, that, Oppenheimer, that von Neumann was the brightest person of the 20th century. I don't know how you prove that, but that was the claim. They used to prank him, at least this is one of the stories. They would write an unresolved equation on the blackboard. And there's a famous story of a composer uh, whose maid could not get him up in the morning. So every morning when she felt he, he should be getting up, she would play an unresolved chord on the piano. <laughs> and he just couldn't stand it. He'd have to come down and resolve the chord. So also, von Neumann would come in, see this unresolved equation, have to go in and finish it. Uh, and here is Hans Bethe, B-E-T-H-E, Bethe who just died about four years ago. Uh, ab uh, absolute, uh, another one of the geniuses. And a uh, um, personal story here. Uh, I was, Beta came through Albuquerque on his way to give talks at Los Alamos on a number of occasions. And one time I was standing in line uh, waiting to talk to him. And the person in front of me was a young reporter uh, from uh, KOB in Albuquerque. And so uh, I overheard her question. And so she said, uh, uh, Dr. Beta, uh, uh, she'd obviously never heard of him, uh, Dr. Beta, I understand you won the Nobel Prize. Is that true? And he smiled and he said, yes, I did. And she said, for what did you win the Nobel Prize? 
and he said, I won the Nobel Prize for my theory on how the sun shines. Uh, without my theory, the sun wouldn't shine. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, had a, I had a friend who, who had a class from Beta. He taught at Cornell. And he said that Beta was not a terribly good teacher, that he was kind of Germanic and plotty. But when students would raise their hand and say, could you tell safety. He was the person who had to make sure after the Trinity test that none of the ranchers living nearby were exposed to excessive amounts of radiation. And I got to interview him too and he said as he explained the situation because the winds came from a variety of directions, General Groves was causing all kinds of trouble. He said when it was all over we were just damn lucky. And his boss, also a physician by the name of Stafford Warren, wrote a famous letter to General Groves saying that New Mexico is too heavily populated and it should not, there should be no more above ground nuclear tests in New Mexico. And there haven't been. There have been two underground tests, um, one near Farmington, one near uh, Carlsbad, but there have been no more above ground tests uh, because there's no region where, you know, as in Nevada, there were fewer people, thanks in part to him. And then here is Jack Hubbard. And he was my main discovery when I was doing my research for the day the sun rose twice. He is the meteorologist at Trinity Side, and he had to call the weather. And here's another idea that your students might respond to. The weather. Compare the weather at Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Trinity, and D-Day. The story of the weather is just absolutely fascinating because it's iffy in every one of those situations. I found Jack Hubbard, you know, it's a you know, rather common name. Uh, I, I knew that he had a diary, but I had no way to locate him. All I knew was he lived in the Los Angeles area, so I used that old tried and true research technique I call long distance. <laughs> And there were four Jack Hubbards, and I got him on the first one. <laughs> and not only that, he said, could I fly you out and have you interview me? <laughs> so I was just incredibly lucky to not only get his diary, which I then donated uh, to uh, <clears throat> Los Alamos, but also uh, I got his story. And the weather was unbelievable. The night of Trinity, the Trinity blast, it was pouring absolutely pouring cats and dogs. <clears throat> General Groves called Oppenheimer, <clears throat> the director of the site, and Hubbard in and said, and I quote, what the hell's wrong with the weather? <laughs> <clears throat> and then Hubbard explained uh, the situation and he said that it would clear around 4.30. He dealt with this uh, weather pattern before and Groves said also, you better be right on this or I will hang you. <laughs> and uh, the weather did clear. And the reason you don't want rain is that rain concentrates the cloud and brings the radiation down in one concentrated area. The wisdom of the 1940s was you want to spread the radiation out. A little bit won't hurt anybody if it's just a one shot. And so that's the wisdom of the 1940s, and that's what they were working on. Jack Hubbard. And who's E.J. Klaus Fuchs? F-U-C-H-S. Who's he? He's the spy. He is the most famous spy in Los Alamos. Now, we are still uncovering spies at Los Alamos, but he is the most important by far because he was in the theoretical division and he gave to the Soviets the exact configuration of the Trinity bomb. <clears throat> and when the Soviets detonated their first bomb in 1949, 